So next up, we have our funded projects. And as I said earlier on, we have 11 of the 15 projects that we funded in 2018. There are four of the uh, large scale demonstrators that Rob mentioned, um, plus um, some of the concept and design projects. So um, for those speakers, um, remember that you have five minutes. This is a five minute overview of your project. Um, Natasha will be driving your slides. So remember to say next slide when you want to move on. Um, and you'll all be unmuted. So please keep quiet when you're not presenting. For everyone else, if you have any questions for the projects, we don't put them into the Q&A box at the bottom. Remember, if you want to talk to the projects, you'll do that through the Meeting Mojo app over lunchtime. Okay, so I will now move on to our first uh, presenter, which is Mark Hamilton from Reflex. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Mark Hamilton, Managing Director of Solo Energy, one of the partner companies in the Reflex project. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, animated, so just one at a time. So Reflex is developing a, the local energy system of the future in Orkney. Uh, the project is all about aggregating flexible power, heat and transport assets with local renewable generation to create an, energy, an integrated energy system. Next. 28.5 million project with 50% funding from Innovate UK. Uh, we started in, in April 2019. And we're really delivering decarbonization without asking the consumer to pay. We don't feel that decarbonization is going to happen uh, if we're asking the consumer to put their hand in the pocket to pay for the assets that are going to deliver decarbonization. Uh, we've got a private sector asset financing model with a replicable business model. So it's, it's about bringing in private sector finance to make decarbonization possible rather than asking the consumer to pay. Next. We've got a consortium of leading industry and academic experts, all with very experienced local knowledge of, of the Orkney energy system and the wider UK energy system. Next. Uh, the goal really is to start the transition toward a carbon neutral Orkney by 2030. We've got a significant head start in Orkney uh, due to the high levels of renewable generation, but there's still, still plenty to do. Uh, what we're doing here would be kind of pointless, we feel, if it was just about addressing uh, issues in, in the Orkney energy system. It's, it's very much about creating a blueprint for UK-wide and global replication. Next. So just reflex and pictures and numbers. Uh, so this is our location. Um, we're deploying a significant number of assets primarily on the demand side of the grid to balance renewable generation. On the power side, we're deploying 500 plus uh, home battery systems along with uh, some micro generation like solar. Uh, 20 or more commercial battery systems. So this is not just for homes, it's also for businesses, as well as one large scale industrial scale, mega, uh, a megawatt scale battery system. On the heat side, uh, we're deploying one of the Doosan Babcock are deploying a large hydrogen CHP system at a leisure centre in Orkney. Uh, 100 or more heat pumps will be deployed as part of the project. We've got no gas grid in Orkney, so it's a very uh, good location to demonstrate uh, electrical heating. On the transport side, uh, there's already a significant uptake of electric vehicles. We're bringing another 500 plus electric vehicles to create uh, probably the highest penetration of uh, EVs per capita anywhere in the, in the UK. All of these assets, sorry, next. All of these assets will be linked to the uh, widespread uh, existing renewable generation uh, assets that we have in, in Orkney. Uh, obviously, renewables are intermittent, and really what we're doing in Reflex is creating a flexible demand side of the grid to be able to respond to the intermittency of local renewable generation. Next. So why Orkney is interesting, this is just a quick overview of the UK energy system, what it looks like. This is August 2019, showing uh, overall electricity demand uh, over the course of, of the month. Below that is the contribution of renewable generation. This is wind and solar uh, that are contributing towards uh, that uh, demand. Uh, obviously, in between is, is met by primarily by controllable fossil fuel generation. If we want to transition to 100% renewables, then we need to look at significantly increasing the level of renewable generation across the system. If we do that, next, uh, if we multiply existing renewable generation capacity by around four, uh, this is what the system would look like, a very uh, peaky and peaky and trophy system of um, 
renewable generation peaks and, uh, and troughs with demand uh, shown as it is today. Really what we're looking to do is to show how we can uh, manage and, uh, the demand side of the grid to be more flexible to respond to the intermittency of renewable generation. So why Orkney is interesting, next, is because the, the future picture of the UK energy system is very much what's happening uh, in the UK, in, in Orkney already. Uh, so really we're looking to start shaping the demand side of the grid to be more responsive to, to renewable generation. Next. Uh, what is an integrated energy system? And sorry, click on again. Uh, and in, um, Sorry, back up again. I think there was a, a slide missing there. Uh, the integrated energy system and what it, what it looks like uh, in, in kind of graphically, uh, really this is what, um, what we're doing within Reflex is monitoring and controlling demand side assets, flexibility assets such as battery systems, uh, flexible electric vehicle charging, flexible electrical heating uh, to be more responsive to the intermittency of renewables. We take the data from site out to the cloud where our Solos FlexiGrid platform manages uh, the assets to be responsive to uh, markets uh, such as uh, the ancillary services markets, grid services markets, balancing market, and local flexibility. So we take all of this data uh, as well as forecasting lo local levels of renewable generation, uh, the significant grid constraints in Orkney, which will all feature as part of the, the management system, uh, and really look to generate the revenues that are needed to recover the cost of the free assets that we are deploying to, to consumers. Next. So just some gifts and wishes uh, to kind of summarize. Um, we have a significant level of, of experience within the team that has started to bring about the, uh, the business model that is needed to, uh, deliver, to deliver the system. Um, we, we have managed to unlock significant levels of private sector financing. There, there are significant levels of, of uh, investments starting to flow into the space, but we do, on the wishes side, need uh, things to happen to make uh, the business models more replicable. We do need uh, regulation to acknowledge the value of flexibility and local balancing uh, to be able to create price signals for flexibility to be able to lock in uh, private sector financing. We also need to work better with DNOs uh, to make uh, what we're doing more, more feasible and um, for them to, to engage to uh, help us to, uh, to, to change the, the system to be uh, more 100% renewable ready. And that's it for me. That's great. Thank you, Mark. So everyone, if you would like to have a chat with Mark over lunchtime, pop into Meet in Mojo and, and organise a, a chat with him. And next up, we have Tim Rose from Energy Superhub Oxford. Thanks, Jenny. And hello, everyone. I hope you can, you can hear me. Um, as Jenny said, my name's Tim Rose. I work for Pivot Power and I'm the program manager for the Energy Superhub Oxford project. Next slide, please. The Energy Superhub Oxford is a 41 million pound project which showcases rapid electric vehicle charging, hybrid battery energy storage systems, low carbon heating and smart energy management, all to support Oxford City Council's journey to zero carbon. Oxford declared a climate emergency in 2019, and it's taking ambitious steps to become a decarbonized city. With a zero emission zone beginning this year, and a range of plans to improve air quality. ESO is a core element of this strategy, and the council is a, a core party in, in our consortium. There are five other partners, which you can see here, led by Pivot Power, and I'll explain more about their roles in, in a second. Next, please. The Energy Superhub delivers innovation in three areas. Firstly, in energy, we're installing the world's first transmission connected hybrid battery. This consists of a giant lithium ion battery and a smaller flow battery. These are two very different chemistries, but they will allow us to optimize overall battery flexibility. Secondly, in transport, we're connecting a high power network, which will provide EV charging at scale for council vehicles and for private vehicles at our Superhub park and ride site. However, we want to see this expand to buses and other commercial fleets in the near future. Thirdly, in heat, we're installing over 300 ground source heat pumps in residential and commercial properties around the city. These will be controlled with smart technology to optimize temperature profiles and to reduce heating bills. And finally, the whole system is controlled by a machine learning based optimization and trading engine, which will manage the batteries to maximize energy market trading revenues 
forecast demand and control energy dispatch for the EV network. And we'll also optimize heating profiles for residents and businesses. Next week. Pivot Power is the project lead and will deliver and install the lithium battery and the cable route. We have Red T providing the flow battery, while Oxford City Council is responsible for the EVs and the charging infrastructure. Kenza Contracting is installing the heat pumps, and the University of Oxford will be our evaluation fund, assessing the social and environmental benefits of the project. Next, please. The project is all about innovation, and as I mentioned, the transmission connected hybrid battery will be the first of its type. It consists of a 50 megawatt lithium ion battery and a two megawatt flow battery with, for the first time, an overdrive facility, allowing us to boost the power for short periods and provide greater flexibility. The hybrid battery will provide services to the national grid, and because the flow battery experiences no degradation, this will allow us to optimize the overall lifetime of the battery. The battery will automatically trade on the day ahead, intraday, and the balancing mechanism markets. Next, please. The project will also be the world's first transmission-connected EV network. We can provide large amounts of power, up to 25 megawatts, which is sufficient to charge 100 ultra-rapid chargers simultaneously. That's, that's equivalent to about 100 supermarkets. And as we're part of the project, as part of the project, we're electrifying the first 37 of the council's fleet vehicles, from tipper trucks and diggers to light commercial vehicles. The system will allow us to shift load to overnight charging to reduce fleet energy costs. We're also running a try before you buy taxi scheme, offering local drivers a chance to try an electric taxi for themselves and hopefully encouraging uptake of EVs in the 100 plus Oxford Hackney Cab fleet. Next, please. The ground source heat pumps will use shared arrays to improve economics and they'll employ smart controls from the properties, which will learn the user's preferences for comfort whilst using a time of use tariff to optimize for heating at low cost and usually greener times of day. Next. And all this is happening this year with a go live plan for the whole system in December. Of course, the PFA project ends in 2022, but we intend the Energy Super Hub to continue to grow and take on new partners and customers for the next 10 years, as I'll just outline next week. So, the system I've just uh, outlined is what we'll deliver by the end of this year. But the exciting thing about this project are the opportunities to expand the Oxford Smile, as we call it. We're in well advanced discussions with two bus companies, next please, uh, in Oxford about bringing them onto the system. Uh, and we'd like to think that Oxford is well positioned to win the 50 million bus town competition recently announced by the government. And this will be a huge de decarbonization and air, air quality win for the city, next. And then in the long term, we'd love to extend the network out to other hubs in the city and possibly beyond. Uh, and it's important to note, this is the first such network to be installed Pivot Power have connection points agreed for another 39 of these super hubs up and down the country. So we hope this is just the beginning. Next. So we're well advanced with the project design and planning, and we'll begin the construction in the spring of this year. The lithium battery has been ordered, and the first heat customers have confirmed go ahead, so we're making good progress. And next, finally, uh, we've of course learned, and we continue to learn, many lessons along the way. Uh, these are a few, I won't go through them in detail. But we hope that allow us to streamline for the next super hub projects and share with others building their own smart local energy systems. So I'm very happy to discuss with these with you later today uh, or outside the conference at our meetings. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tim. And again, if anybody wants to talk to Tim over lunchtime, go into your meeting mojo app and look for the Oxford project. And we're now moving on to Project Leo and Melanie Bryce is our presenter. And I am the Oxfordshire Programme Director for Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks and also the lead on Project LEO, Local Energy Oxfordshire. So LEO is a collaboration of nine partners from across academia, industry and local communities with the vision of being the first building block in the decarbonisation of the county of Oxfordshire. So local energy accelerating net zero. And my challenge today is to condense the first year of a 40 million pound innovation project into the next five minutes. So onto the next slide, please. Focusing on the results so far, we are using the agile project management approach 
creating a series of MVSs or minimum viable systems that are trialing flexibility at the grid edge. There have been three main trials so far and five competitions ran on our Piccolo Flex platform. The first was at the Oxford Bus Company where power was dispatched for a two hour period from two 15 kilowatt batteries that are usually used to charge buses. And the second was at Sanford Hydro, a 440 kilowatt hydro station on the River Thames, ran by Oxfordshire's social enterprise, the Low Carbon Hub. And the third was at the Sackler Library, a university owned asset where the air conditioning demand was reduced to see what the impact would be on the system. So there's been a lot of learning in real world scenarios through the project so far with these three MVSs. The batteries dispatched on time and to order. The hydro didn't dispatch because the water levels were too high. So that's something that we got a lot of learning from. And the demand side response was delayed due to the fact that some of the building management systems are quite sophisticated and start to override themselves. So on to the next slide. So through these MVSs, we've started trialing the services required for flexibility as part of the project. So we've got three services for system operators and two other services for peer to peer. And in order to investigate how to manage issues such as partial or non dispatch, a set of market rules have been developed. These have been informed by a series of market games workshops where all the players in a potential flexibility market were given scenarios to test the issues that might arise. So as we need to understand how this market could work in practice, we've gathered information on over 240 assets across Oxfordshire and are in the process of focusing the search on 12 specific primaries. So these primaries are going to address the core needs of the project. So we've got a variety, um, including a mix of urban and rural, um, some low income areas, an area where there's um, a lot of house building coming online, uh, where there's a heat network, and also where there's a high density of available assets. So on to the next slide. There's been plenty of interest in Leo. Um, at the local, national and international level. So we've been nominated for Partnership of the Year at the Networks 2020 event. We've hosted a Japanese delegation from Tokyo after meeting at the Innovate UK stand at the European Utility Week in Paris and had an article published in the FT focusing on the power of communities in the climate emergency. At the local level, the Low Carbon Hub are launching their Community Energy Fund 2020, encouraging people to show their love for the planet and support an investment opportunity that puts local money to work delivering local energy projects to tackle climate change while paying interest along the way. So on to the next slide. So if you can answer yes to any of the following, um, we would love to speak to you. So if you are an investor in small scale renewable technologies, if you want to build policy to enable greater cross sector collaboration, if you want to understand what a social enterprise is, if you have an asset in Oxfordshire and would like to participate in the trials, if you would like to understand more about the grid edge, or if you would like to replicate this model in your own local area, and importantly, if we want to keep our heads through the energy transition, then it would be lovely if you could, I was going to say visit our stand, but it will be book a meeting slot at lunchtime. Thank you. Thanks very much, Melanie. That's great. OK, so moving on to our, the last of the four demonstrator projects, we have Matthew Lumsden from Smart Hub SLES. Off you go, Matthew. Matthew? Okay, is, um, it might be that Matthew is not online anymore. So Matthew, give you one last chance. Are you there? Oh, 
Okay, not to worry. We'll move on to the next set of presentations. So they, you, you've heard from three of the four uh, demonstrator projects and the next set of uh, presentations now are our concept and design projects that were funded in 2018. And first up, we have David Hutchinson talking about the Isle of Wight. Hello. Hopefully you can hear me. Can somebody confirm? Yes, I can hear you, David. Excellent. Right, brilliant. I'll start then. So far, so good. Um, sorry, I'm just... Uh, there we go. Right. Hi. Good morning. Thank you to UKRI for our invitation to this event. I'm delighted to be able to take this opportunity to update you on our fantastic progress to date. Uh, my name's David. Uh, I sit on uh, an energy advisory group for the Isle of Wight Council, who are lead partner for this project. Um, but I'm also Associate Dean for Innovation within the Faculty of Technology at the University of Portsmouth and Director of Future Isle of Wight uh, Community Interest Company and Green Tech South Limited, all of whom are partners in either our original concept and design phase, Isle of Wight Energy Autonomous Community, or what has become Project Isle. Um, but more of that in a second. So as an initial concept and design phase, uh, we received £109,000 of UK government investment in line with the usual Innovate UK funding rules for six months. Uh, and with this investment, we have generated both momentum and excitement, but also an initial concept and design for an energy autonomous community for the Isle of Wight. Um, the partners were as denoted in the logos that you can see and included both large energy and community energy companies, uh, those with expertise from other countries such as Germany in creating alternative energy markets, a software innovation and data governance company and the usual complement of academic experts, um, all led uh, expertly by the local unitary authority, the Isle of Wight Council. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there we go. The Isle of Wight's unique island community presents a vast array of opportunity for sustainable development. Uh, we are a UNESCO um, biosphere reserve now, uh, with physical and political boundaries being one and the same. Uh, the island lends itself to, uh, in a unique manner for UK PLC to really take the next step and demonstrate net zero sustainable solutions that will still lead to innovation and clean growth, uh, demonstrating those solutions at an economically viable real world scale in a way that customers would use them. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a rich pedigree for great moments in innovation. Uh, the UK's first production electric car, the hovercraft, the world's first permanent wireless radio station from which we can trace our world of instant global communication, uh, the birth of the modern rock festival within the UK, and the epicenter for developments around circular economy as the location for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And now we hope a world-class demonstrator that delivers prosperity from the energy revolution. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as with many projects, this is where we started. Um, with a small proportion of the entire island population, which included 27,000 residents, 15,000 homes, uh, with over a third of those off gas and subject to high fuel costs, utilizing carbon intensive energy such as oil or even coal with higher than average fuel poverty. Uh, the Isle of Wight provides a window into our future where we already have significant generation from re renewable energy, um, but our power grid cannot cope with effectively allowing more renewable generation that makes financial sense for investors, despite there being a queue of companies that wish to install more, particularly solar PV. Uh, in, at the moment, that's not that usual, but in the future, it's predicted that this will become the norm. So by solving the challenges on the island now, we intend to help accelerate the UK transition to a net zero clean growth economy and indeed provide uh, a smoother transition to the new age of distributed systems operation. Our initial approach was to attack all of this uh, from a household and business centric position, trying to balance supply and demand, maximise and increase the generation of renewables and ensure flexibility for the grid the usual story. Um, but through our six month study, we have identified quite rapidly actually in that six months that this approach is not optimal, sustainable or financially viable. Indeed, some say we're going to end up working out how to decarbonize the aircraft industry before we manage the domestic energy market. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where we've ended up. Um, with a concept for the whole island that puts the community at the heart of the challenge and approaches the whole system 
from as much a transport perspective as an energy one. Uh, it will deliver a solution for over 140,000 residents. We're the second highest populated island in, in Europe, I think, if not the world. I'm not sure. No, it must be Europe. Uh, but we, um, so a solution for over 140,000 residents and 2.6 million annual visitors. The concept is founded on a trading entity known as Citizen Energy Community, which operates for the benefit of that community. It will be a non-profit distributing commercial company governed by community representatives with social and environmental objectives. It will supply heat, power and mobility to customers and seek to extract additional value streams from the integrated energy system. Flexibility will be incentivized through time of use tariffs, which will be offered by the CEC. Customers will be able to choose whether they wish to be active or passive actors in the system. Uh, and we are seeking to develop a fully tested technical solution free from regulatory restriction with an investment grade business case that will attract significant commercial investment. Uh, next slide, please. Inevitably, to dis deliver such an adventurous solution, uh, we have had to add expertise and experience to the initial partnership. Uh, and picking up on Rob's points at the outset, we've made sure that we've ensured that we have data, legal and financial partners recognize the importance of these areas for commercial success and sustainability of these projects. Next slide, please. So in summary, Project Isle, I save with local energy, sorry, hopes to build trust in the energy system, reducing the cost of connection, improving the efficiency of the distributed network, uh, and providing consumers with greater choice and savings on heat, power, and e-mobility. It will create local jobs and significant investment. Um, we have managed to generate private investment commitments for a detailed design phase of over 1.4 million, which represents more than a tenfold return on the original government investment. Um, but it might be, having not been successful in the latest call, uh, that we need to get a bit more disruptive and go bigger more quickly. Uh, I'd be delighted to speak with anyone with vision and ambition at lunchtime via Mojo or any other time um, if you think you could help us support this fantastic opportunity. Last slide, please. Uh, Oh, there's a mistake on there. Sorry. Um, I'll tell you what it is. Right. I've, I've added my contact details, um, but it is actually david.hutchinson at smartisland.live. Um, so if you can't contact via Mojo, I'd be delighted to, to uh, talk with you. Um, and although I can't say come and talk to us on stand two, we've tried to create a little slice of the Isle of Wight and more information uh, on a digital stand, which you can find at uh, project-isle.com. That's project-isle.com. Um, and we've tried to provide you with a bit more information there. Um, you can also get in contact with me uh, through the website. Um, thank you so much uh, for all your time and attention this morning. Thanks for listening, uh, and I hope you've found that useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Oh, you did my job for me there. We're going to go back and give Matthew another try. So Natasha's going to move the slides back for me to, I hope, to the Smart Hub, S-L-E-S, -E the one before David's. Keep going, keep going. There, smashing. Now, Matthew, please talk. <laughs> Matthew? Hi, can you yes. hear me? Yes, uh, you can. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you for your patience, everybody. I'm Matthew Lumsden, uh, and I'm uh, from Connected Energy, and I, I chair the Smart Hub SLES con consortium. Um, so Smart Hub's a £31 million large-scale demonstration project, um, looking to deploy a range of different technologies throughout the region of West Sussex. Uh, and you can see the project partners along the bottom of the screen. ISACs will be supplying um, marine source heat systems, uh, Moixa, domestic energy storage, PV, EV charging infrastructure, and be aggregating the system on their grid share platform. Passive will be providing domestic air source heat systems, connected energy, um, second life battery based energy storage systems, ITM power, hydrogen uh, refueling infrastructure, and West Sussex will be providing uh, sort of local regional support within West Sussex. And then finally, Newcastle University providing modelling and analysis as the project gradually develops. Could you move me on to the next slide, please? 
So in many ways, Smart Hub is about taking a head-on approach to dealing with the diversities of delivering distributed energy systems. So it's about dealing with the realities. Within any region, in this case, West Sussex, stakeholders have differing objectives, reduced energy costs, improved air quality, an improved carbon footprint, improved resilience, reduced health care and, and, and building maintenance costs. So we're aiming to develop a better understanding of how energy systems can be created, operated and optimised to satisfy the needs of various stakeholders without creating conflicts. And how can we understand and quantify these, these various different and diverse benefits? This is all in the context of creating a system with independent partners and meeting the requirements of investors and co-funders with differing objectives. We also aim to create a living pro project, a living model that can evolve and be replicated over time to gradually learn more and more about this kind of system. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and again. Okay, so the project includes a range of different technologies integrated through a, 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 at a number of different levels. So we have domestic properties fitted with varied combinations of air source heat, electric storage, PV panels and EV chargers. Um, we have dis distributed domestic and light commercial EV charging infrastructure, some linked with, to rooftop PV. Next, please. We have EV charging hubs, including a combination of AC and DC chargers, PV canopies, and second life battery energy storage. Next, please. We have a, a, a distributed network of behind the meter um, second life batteries installed on industrial and commercial sites. We have a large scale energy storage system, again, using second life batteries. that will be around about 14 and a half megawatt hours installed directly into the, the grid infrastructure. Next, please. Next, okay, so we have a hydrogen refueling station. Uh, next, we have a marine source heat pump and network. And then finally, at the top level, we have, a, we have an aggregation system, which will aggregate the various different technologies at multiple levels, ranging from household through to cluster, through to working on, working on how we can aggregate a number of different systems um, with different priorities. So a multi, multi-leveled aggregation system and optimization system to create a virtual power plant. Next, please. Okay, so what are we aiming to achieve and who will benefit? We'll have a significant portfolio of technologies that can provide varying degrees of flexibility. This flexibility will be governed by market requirements, site and vehicle usage, investor returns, technical capabilities, etc. Our aim is to provide what you would expect, a lower cost, lower carbon, lower impact energy system, but one that accelerates uptake by using asset synergies and optimization to capture and deliver additional value to its stakeholders. So key questions, examples of key questions we'll aim to, aim to work on. is how can we improve, how can improvements in air quality be linked to the business case for an EV charger? How can reduced dilapidation costs offset the costs of heating social housing? How can the value of distributed energy storage be fully realized? By demonstrating some of the answers to these questions, we aim to make systems of this nature more investable, scalable and replicable. Next, please. So finally, why is a smart hub an attractive mechanism? Fundamentally, because the Innovate UK funding reduces the risk of commercial and technical innovation, but also the project forces accelerated and prioritised collaboration, which will ultimately lead to a short -term, shorter term commercialisation of higher value innovation. And that's everything from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matthew. That's great. OK, so we're going to get back on track now with our concept and design projects. And the next one up is Rajvant uh, Nijar from the Bank Energy Project. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope, I hope yeah. you can. The, 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 the mic is going. Firstly, thank you um, for inviting us to, to present today and also um, echoing Rob's words about the, the really fast turnover that the KTN team has managed to, to create this event today. So my name is Rajvant Nija. I'm the director and project lead for Bank Energy, which um, is all about creating um, bankable energy assets um, and realizing the full potential 
of those assets. So next, please. And next again. So the government has set this uh, challenge of uh, net zero by 2050, and uh, we as industry have, have got to meet this challenge. The, I think one of the key sort of areas of, of, of problems is that we have generally a lack of visibility of our energy assets on our whole system. There's also perhaps a, you know, a lack of a standardized approach when it comes to you know, whole systems and whole systems trading um, and, and, and how we optimize basically the whole value chain from a building right the way up into the grid supply point. Also, as, as some of the other projects have touched upon, you know, as we move more and more towards sort of 2030, 2040, we will see a lot more renewables onto our energy system, which obviously means um, more intermittent uh, um, supply, um, generation, and it's how do we balance between, you know, these multiple energy suppliers, not just um, in electricity, but across heat power and, and sort of, Un unplanned or, or unwarranted sort of demands from electric vehicles that are very hard to predict. Next bullet. And so I think, um, you know, Bank Energy is really committed to providing market solutions for, for net zero. And we've, we're very much looking at that whole systems approach um, across heat power and mobility. And um, as also mentioned earlier, um, the Energy Data Task Force report, we're, we're very sort of committed to also having an open source platform where the competition lies one layer above providing open data across multiple energy suppliers. Next bullet. So our solution really is about creating local marketplaces, um, being technology and supplier agnostic in terms of, a, a, you know, a very sort of simple sort of plug and play fit um, so we're not in competition with energy suppliers or technology providers we're, we're pr trying to provide the competition one layer above um, and also just providing you know a secure platform for energy and flexibility trading which we can then scale nationwide next point um, and actually our test facility is is london south Bank university where we'll be carrying out this this end-to-end -end solution next slide please so our location um, and, and rollout plan um, we are london south bank focused hence the bank energy name and we have three um three main areas so there's the waterloo cluster which is sort of built up into north and mid and south we have london south bank um, just by the elephant and castle roundabout and we've also got King's College London um, towards London Bridge. Um, if you just click through next, we've had some massive support and engagement. Um, we're speaking to Lambeth Council, um, engaging them as part of, um, um, they've also declared a climate emergency and we're working with them on, on a strategy. Our partners have included King's College London, Buig, and these are all the sort of people that we're talking to actively right now to use our end-to-end -end solution. Next, next, if you just scroll through the next three, three bullets, that's it. And these are some of our preliminary kind of um, analysis um, and findings from the design and concept stage as to the sort of value of the carbon savings as well as the financial savings. Next point. And we're starting local, but going global. Next point. So proving the concept on London South Bank, as I said, we're, as we're providing this end-to-end -end solution, we are working with a number of different energy suppliers. We're working behind the meter at the virtual PowerPoint um, level with, across different microgrids. Bank Energy will provide the function of aggregation and settlement. And then we're looking forward all the way up to the wholesale markets, energy and flexibility trading. And that is um, the concept that we will be proving on an London South Bank. Next point. Effectively developing a framework and blueprint for industry. Next point, please. So if we look at um, how we're going to do this, um, first of all, there is asset selection. So right at the building level, what are the assets we can use for flexibility? And we've taken, again, a very customer-centric approach 
um, because we realise that the risk appetite is different and we need to work with our different asset owners to, to get the, you know, the optimum um, um, out of their assets. Next point. Then there is a technology deployment phase, and this could either be existing microgrids, peer-to-peer -peer trading, but eventually we are developing a virtual power plant. Next point. This virtual power plant then would, it will enable energy trading right the way through these neural networks that we're developing, all the way up to um, you know, grid supply point. Next, next point. And all throughout the process, we are staying very customer focused and testing um, with our customers all the, all the way throughout. Next, please. So our end-to-end -end trading um, is optimizing revenue, revenues for asset owners as well as saving carbon. Next, please. We are on track to commercialize in 2021. So in 2019, we received um, 140K in investment from Innovate UK. Our partners put in the remainder, so we've invested 200,000. We did a lot of stakeholder engagement and developed that strategy for heat power and EV. Next, please. We start um, a detailed design phase in, in April, where again, we have invested a total of 500,000. Uh, we've received about 300, we're receiving 340K from Innovate UK. And this is to develop the industry standard or, or framework for energy and flexibility trading. In um, 2021, we are seeking further investment to commercialize and monetize. Um, and that's for Bank Energy to become a lead party and to provide optimized energy income and carbon savings across the whole value chain. Next, please. And in 2023, um, we are looking to scale and we're expecting um, annual revenues at that point of around about 5 million. Next, please. Effectively, we are developing this investable trading platform, delivering affordable, clean energy to all our consumers. Next, please. We are uniquely positioned to deliver the industry leading solution. Um, we've got exclusive access into the whole London South Bank uh, community. Um, through one of our partners, the South Bank Employers Group. We are validating our business model at each stage with the asset owners. Next, please. It is about an end-to-end -end whole systems approach, um, co-created by the market for the market. Next, please. We are also very conscious about the Energy Data Task Force work and therefore looking at open uh, source energy database. And one of the keys is really about creating resilient local marketplaces nationwide. So, you know, we are, um, we're, we're not impacted by other changes, um, at, you know, externalities. And do come and visit us on Meeting Mojo, where we will offer a virtual cup of coffee, um, if you smell the aroma already. And um, thank you very much and uh, hope to speak to you soon. Thank you very much, Radvan. And as she said, please do uh, jump onto Meeting Mojo and sign up with any of the speakers. If you were trying to find Mark Hamilton, um, he has now joined Meeting Mojo. So if, if you wanted to talk to Mark, he was the first speaker, you will be able to connect with him now. So moving on to our next project, and we have Greg Dujon from ePort Project. Good morning. Um, I'm from EA Technology. Uh, we were the lead partner in developing uh, the, this project. We looked at the potential for delivering substantial CO2 emission reductions and energy cost savings for the industrial sector based around the Ellesmere Port area. Uh, we chose the Ellesmere Port area because it has a high industrial cluster and we are looking to secure the future jobs uh, and increase, improve the competitiveness of the industries in that area. Um, we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we were looking to cut carbon emissions by 20% by 2030. Uh, we secured the, uh, the relationship with the local government, uh, Cheshire, West and Chester, as well as the local enterprise partnership from Warrington. It's important that we looked at improving the competitiveness of the industries in that area. Um, it is uh, an area of high growth and has seen some decline in the uh, competitiveness of the industry in that area as the uh, cost of energy has gone up. Um, so there's a high consumption of gas and electricity for industrial processes in that area. 
consequently high CO2 emissions. Some of the industries produce hydrogen as a byproduct, and there's already large scale renewable energy generation uh, in Frodsham and through uh, Protoss Business Park. There's also a, coincidentally a high hydrogen intake for industrial process, largely in the manufacture of fertilizers. The area is also adjacent to the high net project, uh, and we're looking to derive synergies from the, that separate project. Uh, one of our partners, Caden Gas, is leading that project. Um, it, there's also high activity, high level activity around carbon capture uh, out into the Irish Sea. We've also detected that there was a large amount of waste heat from industrial process, and we were looking to see whether that could be utilized in a cross vector solution uh, for heating and other industrial processes. As a result of the high uh, industrial cluster, uh, a lot of goods come in and out of the area, creating a high degree of HGV movements. And we are looking cross vector to see how we might electrify or how we might decarbonize transport, heat, and industrial process, as well as electricity generation. So, next slide, please. So, we looked at uh, the whole energy ecosystem starting with the primary sources of energy of hydrogen, electricity, and gas, how those might be stored, and how they might be converted to other applications for use in industrial processes. Uh, the partners are listed at the bottom, uh, Burns and McDonald for some of the engineering designs, Caden Gas for the high net network and the transition away from natural gas to hydrogen, uh, the Cheshire Energy Hub, which brings together most of the industrial customers in that area, Cheshire West and Chester for the local government, uh, the local enterprise partnership, uh, Peel Environmental, who are a uh, high, uh, they own most of a lot of the properties around that area and are investing in hydrogen production and renewable energy, Scottish Power Energy Networks, which is a local distribution company, the University of Chester for some of the modeling and energy trading platforms, and Urenco for the uh, innovative micromodular reactor that they are working to develop. We looked at the pathways from the uh, pure sources of energy and what they're used for. So we looked at what might be done for heat and we defined what the heat distribution network would look like. And we also looked at which energy sources were most applicable for uh, generating heat and how we might capture that waste heat from the industrial processes. On the transport side, we looked at the EV charging network, how we might go about refueling HGVs for hydrogen, and optionally, very uh, light touch, we looked at what we might be able to do around train refueling for hydrogen. Uh, from the working and living environment, we looked at using non-processed energy for uh, uh, buildings and homes, and looked at the building management systems and how we might be able to improve those and make them more aligned with the energy production. We also looked at the, uh, the industrial business processes and how we might align the demand for those business processes with energy availability. Also looked at the criteria for selecting which energy sources should be used for industrial processes and how we might capture energy, any excess energy for redistribution. Um, we also looked at waste heat and carbon capture. Um, our current focus is on creating the business model um, we're looking at the economic model, basically how the cash flows, the operational model, as in who might, how this might work, because this is an, a new operational model and there is no, as far as we can tell today, any entity trading a cross vector in the way we envisage it having to be implemented for uh, this project to be successful. There are some regulatory requirements we think we will need to change or that will need to be changed to allow this to happen. We are basically looking at a ring fenced. Uh, energy system and we need to look at the relationship with the rest of the UK market. It's quite important for the industri industries in that area to have security of supply and therefore we do need to develop the links to the rest of the network to ensure that the businesses continue to operate regardless of the variability of energy production that might be taking place within the, the environment. And we're also investigating with the University of Chester what pricing dynamics we might need, not just for electricity and gas, but for waste heat and for transferring energy and hydrogen from one business to another. There isn't really a market 
definition today of how to trade across energy sectors. Next slide, please. So overall, we've had a positive indication of positive feedback for the concept. Um, surprisingly, we found that between 2 and 5% of UK energy consumption is uh, within the Ellesmere Airport area. That represents a significant cash flow uh, going into and out of the energy system. We've also found that the credibility of the concept is highly dependent on data collection. We do need to know who's using energy when and at what time. Uh, but those, those are commercially sensitive for some of the target customers in that area. We've also calculated through our modeling that the electricity network could relatively easily accommodate the flexible trading arrangements and the required EV infrastructure. The direct links to the high net project will deliver significant common benefits. And we think we can achieve the 20-30% objective of 100% renewable energy and electrification of heat using the existing and planned network investments within the spend area. However, the business case, as we've developed it so far, is highly dependent on the CO2 emissions tax regime. Some of the things we do need to develop further uh, are around the business model. Who owns it, who operates it, whether it's for profit, not for profit, are the consumers and customers and industries in the area, uh, the actual owners, or uh, should there be third party investments? Uh, the trading boundary with the national systems is key to what we, we need to do. There might be significant energy imports and exports from the area at different times of day, and that needs to be defined, and we need to establish how that might work. Again, security of supply for the industries are quite important, um, and we need to look at the regulatory environment for those within that area because they will essentially effectively be captive customers. And they will need, we will need a long-term commitment from the customer base over probably up to 10 to 20 years to ensure that the business plan is positive. Um, we should have included potential investors up front in order to help us de define the business case more accurately and make it more investable. And that is what we're working on right now. Uh, our 2040 objectives uh, of, for carbon reduction requires us to work uh, do a lot more work with the carbon capture project and we're now turning our focus to doing that and we have some work to do on the hydrogen developments required for refueling of HGVs. Uh, there's a lot more detail to the project uh, but in the time available we thought we'd just give you a flavor of what we're doing and we'd love to speak to you later at some point through Meeting Mojo or we'll supply our details through Jenny so you can contact us directly. Thank you very much. That's lovely, thank you very much Greg. Okay, speakers, we are sliding a little bit away from the timings of five minutes per presentation. Uh, I know it's all great stuff, so that's why I haven't shut you up, but we do need to keep on track. So, Gra uh, Graham, it's over to you for a five-minute presentation on Green Skies. Well, fine. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Hi, everyone. It's Graham. I'm from London South Bank University, and I'm representing a fantastic team um, on Green Skies. Next slide, please. And uh, Green Skies is an acronym. It stands for Green uh, Smart Community Integrated Energy Systems. It's all about supplying mobility, heat, and power um, initially in Islington. Um, so we were one of the feasibility studies, which we'll tell you a little bit about. And we will then talk a little bit about the detailed design. There is an animation on here. So next, if you can press the, uh, the, maybe the animation, that's great, that's great. So it's um, integrated heat, mobility and power, local energy network, originally in Islington. It uses a fifth generation network, um, heat network, that enables, that's an ambient loop, that enables sharing of heat between different applications. On the right, you can see a fantastic intergram that we, it, we've produced, and it includes some of the areas that we're gonna share heat from. So the tube, data centre, swimming pools, etc. Um, but it also connects to the, the grid and to renewable energy to be able to use electricity when it's available at the cheapest possible rate. Um, the sharing uh, makes, makes the, the cost um, of, of provision uh, as low as possible and we, we manage that with flexibility and artificial intelligence. On the left hand side is there are three C's you can see. Um, the concept of Green Skies is all about working with the community to de deliver low carbon, low cost energy. Next slide, please. So um, 
Green Skies, um, we're going to be building upon in the detailed design the successful feasibility and um, the, we're going to be producing a detailed design um, specifically in Islington with a clear path to, to demonstration and replication elsewhere in the UK. Next point, please. Um, there are four main, keep going, four main activities um, which include detailed design, keep going, keep going, um, case studies, replication, and legacy. Thank you. Um, so I think um, Rob mentioned before that this is this is not just about specifically um, one one project. This is about making sure that we deliver replication and legacy. And Green Skies is is not just focused on uh, Islington. It's focused on how we can can make sure we can deliver both of those as well through business models, policy, design process, knowledge transfer, engagement, etc. Next slide, please. So um, this is a bit of detail, but um, we, we're looking at um, secondary heat sources, and one of them is the York Road station. If you carry on, Preston, <laughs> the animations. This, oh, back one, back one, sorry. This is, unfortunately, we haven't got a chance to show this. On the right-hand side shows an animation of a heat from the tube, actually how we might go about capturing it from this station. This station is central to, to, to the scheme, but we've also got data centers and other um, energy sources that we are allowed to share heat from. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, so this is our approach. Um, it looks quite complicated, lots of pictures, but it's not really, it's all about learning by doing, being out there in the community, trying to make this happen in the right way. Uh, um, with, 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 with actually, um, the community involved and and with customers um, as, uh, 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 that we're going to work with at, at the centre and um, at the same time on the right hand side you can see we've got this quite complicated mapping and and modelling and um, so we're actually working with the community to, and at the same time we've got this complicated complex um, um, energy uh, uh, modelling system enabled to give to, to be able to identify real results in terms of carbon costs and etc. Next slide, please. Again, that's a video showing us walking around. Um, so yeah, go carry on. <laughs> um, so this is what the Islington demonstration will look like. It's a big map. It's about six, four or four, four to six kilometres. Um, we're serving this number of residents and buildings, et cetera, and these are the impacts that we're predicting. Um, but Green Skies is not just about replication um, in, in Islington, it's about replication uh, around the country and further afield. So we also have Sheffield and West Midlands involved, and I encourage those outside of those areas, if you want to find more about what we're doing in Green Skies and actually how we can help you replicate, please contact me afterwards. Next slide, please. So innovation's key, and um, if you carry on pressing the button, please, <laughs> to, to reveal. Um, the, 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 on the left-hand side is academic innovation that we've been producing. This is a, a, a diagram of um, fifth, fourth, one to four gener generation networks that was published, been used many times, but we've, we've adapted it and published it, and now it's getting many citations. That's from an academic sense. On the right-hand side shows actually some of the other innovations that are coming from from, from Green Skies that we, we, we want to make sure, get out there and, and make sure replication happens. Um, final slide, I think, please. Um, yeah, so there's lots of stuff going on. We're making lots of impact. Um, we, we, our ambition is actually replication and legacy, not just in Islington, it's about elsewhere. If you want to find out more um, about what we're doing, if you want to get involved in what we're doing, please um, please get on to the Green Skies website, greenskies.com, or, or catch me in, in, in the chat a little bit later. That's all for now. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you, Graham. And now moving swiftly on to Andy Scott from Lemdex. Thank you, Jenny. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andy Scott from Swan Barton. Um, our project was LEMDEX, it was a concept uh, project, local energy markets in Devon and Exeter. Uh, our consortium consisted of the university, the local authorities in that area and the community energy group. And we were looking at how Swan Barton's peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform could be used to encourage local matching of energy. And that's matching predominantly around electricity, but also looking at how transport, heat and fuel would, would integrate with that. Um, next slide, please. So 
we set our project boundary as Western Powers um, constraint managed zone definition to consider how um, energy would be flowing in and out of the, the local area we're considering. Um, it was a great area in terms of mix of assets. We've got industrial, commercial, domestic represented in there as well as, as already having um, electric vehicles and plans for heat networks. So there's some, some good sites to get data from. Um, and a key thing we were tr really trying to achieve with this is not only get participant value, so people who participated would, would see benefit in being part of trying to better use energy, but also system value. So reducing um, energy balancing costs, reducing um, network constraints um, and uh, connection issues, things like that. Could we go to the next slide? Um, and the work we did was, was um, a lot of simulation work and also some studies into the commercial and technical issues. So in terms of simulation, we've got a, um, a peer to peer trading system that we can effectively take real data and feed it in and replay what we would, would happen if we put different asset mixes in there using demand and generation data. We used half hourly data off generation assets and sites, but we also gathered some one second data using accurate power meters because we're interested in what would happen if you traded more frequently than within the classic half hour that we use today in, in, in the GB network. Um, so we ran that through the simulation um, what it showed is that by giving relatively small financial incentives um, on to automated systems to match, that does reduce the import export. So it is beneficial for things like constraint management. Um, one minute trading is better than half hour trading, um, definitely in terms of reducing um, power spikes and the price incentives required to do that are actually quite modest using automated systems. Um, we also looked at how we would bring this into the real energy system today. Billing integration was interesting. Smart meters already often provide better than half hourly data through the consumer unit, consumer access device. Um, but most domestic billing systems can't do half hourly. So smart meter data today just gets aggregated up to the, often to the month or to a couple of billing periods. So um, that, that was interesting. Uh, next slide, please. On the commercial side, we did workshops with meetings with um, licensed suppliers, Ofgen, Alexa, and, and the DNOs. Um, there are a number of regulatory challenges um, with this, not surprisingly. It's a, it's a, it would be a major change to move to allow people to do matching. Um, a huge aspect today really is around how we bill for electricity. If somebody imports electricity to their site, they're paying about a third of the price as to generation, which is representative of somebody if they were buying or matching. There are then the other levies that the other 60, 60 odd percent is added on regardless of what matching. And, and right now there's no easy way of rewarding somebody for um, participating in a matching scheme. So that, that's, that's quite a major blocker. Um, another interesting thing that uh, we encountered was we, we looked at an off-gem sandbox and, and that was not really, uh, th that was rejected you know, with, a, with a, a parallel project we're involved in um, because they're not interested in doing that with charging. So, um, and there's no real easy way of accessing flexibility rewards um, to, to general users. Participant recruitment's also challenging. Um, assets are normally commercially committed in with licensed suppliers or PPAs in place. So that's a practical issue going forward to trials. And can we go to the last slide? So I'm actually very optimistic about um, local matching, local energy. Net zero is going to increase the value of this. Um, we, we, we do need it. And, and while there's barriers, we, we need to crack on and develop solutions now. Um, we'd love to uh, talk more with, with people about this. So please, if you're interested, do get in touch. Clearly you can't visit our stand, um, but we'd, we'd love to have a meeting or, or get in touch. My email address is there. So thank you for your time. Um, and that's, that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Angie, that's great. Okay, so moving on to Anthony Morgan from Power Transition. Uh, hi everybody, yes, I'm Anthony Morgan, CEO of uh, Power Transition. 
Um, and uh, we basically uh, uh, got some funding to uh, develop a proof of concept around the development of a distributed ledger uh, microgrid management platform. Um, the project that we were looking at specifically was uh, in Corby, if you can move to the next slide please, um, which is a, a development of 47 zero carbon houses, um, each with about uh, five kilowatts of PV on the roof. Um, there's a, a heat pump in each property, uh, about five kilowatts of, of, uh, of battery storage. Um, and although we're not interested specifically in, in uh, developing our own microgrid, uh, this was all about uh, using the platform to effectively um, allow peer-to-peer -peer energy trading to take place between, uh, between the properties. Um, actually, since the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the project has been completed, we're now actually looking at implementing a full microgrid on the site uh, and moving the, the meter point uh, which will allow us then also to use the the uh, the the, uh, the DLT platform for for flex market opportunities as well. Next slide, please. So as I said, the uh, the, the the idea from the project initially was just looking at how we could uh, effectively manage peer to peer um, energy trading using uh, distributed ledger technology, um, and how that could be used to optimize the uh, the, the energy uh, supply across the site. So. The, uh, what we found uh, with, through the work that was done uh, with our academic partner, uh, which was Cardiff University, was actually looking at uh, uh, so both carbon reduction and, uh, and uh, energy consumption. If you look at this from a community point of view, it has the biggest impact. Um, so, and we, the, our platform is able to, uh, to, to, to manage energy flows in real time. Uh, so it's managed, it's able to, to uh, transmit an awful lot of data, and make data decisions basically on what is happening within the energy across the community. So although this was done in a virtual environment, we're now implementing this into uh, the, the actual grid itself. Um, and we are looking to, to uh, at ways to incentivize customers to switch away from their, their, uh, their existing suppliers and basically onto our scheme. And that will be through things like uh, uh, re reduced, uh, reduced costs. Um, and we're also uh, integrating um, electric vehicles within the within this as well. So it's, it's both looking at the optimization from the vehicle point of view, uh, but also from the uh, from the, the energy uh, across the site to, for, for the use within the electric vehicles. So next slide, please. So on the other side of that, once we've got the uh, the, the the grid. Uh, implemented we'll be looking at, uh, at the uh, any surplus that's generated on site and what we can do that through the uh, uh, balancing mechanisms and uh, sort of the, the flex uh, flex auctions and we're having conversations at the moment with uh, with both suppliers and uh, uh, sort of flex uh, market companies where we're looking at the uh, optimization using the platform to optimize their service again this is all about uh, real-time data uh, so this is this is not about a half hourly uh, settlement. We can actually do this in real time. So we the, the platform is able to handle vast amounts of transactions at a very very low energy cost. So we can provide the optimization services needed uh, to effectively run these networks more efficiently. So Corby being the demonstrator, but you know our platform is actually the or our business model, sorry, is going out and and, and talking to uh, to the various people within the supply chain on how we can use our technology to optimize their services. So it's very much a partnership model. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the, the, the data architecture actually of our platform um, is, is, uh, um, is infinitely scalable. So we can, although we're looking at uh, uh, sort of the core, in, in the case of the Corby project on obviously a very small microgrid development, um, the same data, data architecture could actually be scaled up and replicated across the entire energy uh, network. So we can track um, energy from point of production, transmission, storage, and consumption um, in real time. Um, we also, within the platform, we, we uh, have embedded reporting mechanisms for non-financial reporting. So we can report on UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and report on things like the impact on carbon reduction and also uh, social impact from, uh, from the, the decisions or, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the applications of the technology. Um, the, 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 the actual platform itself is, is, uh, uh, has state-of-the-art security, so it's, it's GDPR compliant just by the nature of, of how it's, it's, uh, um, how it's uh, been put together using the DLT. Um, it is very high performance, so it can do um, over 10,000 transactions per second. 
um, and it uses a, a very, very small amount of energy. So we actually use uh, about one watt uh, of, of energy per transaction. If you compare that to something like Visa, which is using about three watts per transaction, um, and you know, is, is, is things like uh, uh, Bitcoin, which are probably 55 kilowatt hours uh, of energy per transaction, which, you know, so for this particular sort of app, Application within the energy sector, uh, the uh, uh, the technology is ideally suited. Um, we've also developed a, an, uh, a number of, of out the box uh, sort of D apps, so we can uh, very very quickly uh, develop a, a specific use case to uh, for for an application for a customer. So it's very rapid to to uh, uh, to, to um, produce our, the, the D app, and it's also um, scalable and low cost. So next slide, please. So since uh, completing the, 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 the Corby project, we've been looking at, uh, say, the services that we can provide. And we've got, as I mentioned before, a number of, of, uh, of conversations underway across the energy supply chain on how we can uh, integrate our platform into, into their services. Um, and these include the IMAS, which is effectively what we developed around the Corby project, which is integrated microgrid as a service. Um, EVOS, which is a specific um, application for electric vehicle leasing. Uh, where we can embed the cost of energy um, and mileage within the actual leasing arrangement of the vehicle. Um, we provide data services um, and then there's various D apps we provide, but we're producing for third parties, which are also there as well. So if you have any questions, obviously on any of these or, or want to get more information, then um, then happy to share that information during the, uh, the, the, the meeting mojo session. Um, and final slide, please. So that's, uh, that sort of summarizes sort of everything from my point of view. Please get in touch uh, to find out more information about uh, what we're doing and, and how uh, the Power Transition platform uh, can, uh, can be used potentially to optimize also the, uh, some of the other projects as well that, uh, that have been uh, talked about uh, during this session. And just on a, finding, a final closing note, uh, going back to Robert uh, Saunders' initial address, this is all about in order to get uh, smart energy networks to to uh, work effectively uh, you need to have a, a, a trusted data um, uh, as a prerequisite of that you know and effectively this is what our platform provides so we can really use that for uh, uh, for, for optimization and, and actually make, making smart, uh, smart ne energy networks happen okay thank you very much thank you anthony Okay, and now on to our very last um, project pitch this morning from Neil Jones talking about Greater Manchester Delay. Hi, Neil. Neil? now can you hear me yes that's great lovely yes so, sorry Jane. my 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 headphones are literally about to die so you will definitely get a short sweet presentation from me so I don't <laughs> right. okay everybody hello my name is uh neil jones i'm from uh upside energy i've been asked to step in and just present these uh, slides on behalf of greater manchester so i'll get my proviso now that this isn't my slide deck and my uh, my headphones are about to die so we will definitely whip through this very very quickly uh next slide please so uh, Greater Manchester, what was the, the, the concept of the Greater Manchester Energy Market? Well, we wanted to look to see how energy could be traded at scale. Uh, Greater Manchester, like many other cities, have uh, a net zero carbon target. One of the reasons to uh, achieve that will be through the management uh, and, and the generation of its own energy supply. And what Greater Manchester wanted to do was to understand how that would look, both being able to sell uh, energy to equip components parts. As you can see from that picture, there's 10 local borrowers that comprise of Greater Manchester, each with their own uh, needs and requirements. So how could we balance the energy across the conurbation? But equally, how could we balance energy or sell any excess energy uh, to the wider markets, as well as dealing with any energy constraints that uh, uh, Urgency Northwest, our DSO, or the national grid may be uh, providing. Uh, as you can see, there's a fairly small consortium, uh, the combined authority, uh, upside ourselves, we uh, provide demand side response services uh, through a cloud-based platform. Brontwood, a large commercial office owner uh, in the city and elsewhere in the UK, uh, Hitachi, everybody knows, uh, and I just see Northwest. Next slide, please. 
So this slide looks incredibly messy, and this is why I said I didn't write this slide, but if you ignore all the lines uh, and you basically look at the, the hierarchy starting at the bottom, what, uh, what the LEM was trying to understand was in a world where you have uh, local renewable generation at the bottom, be that PV, be that uh, battery storage, be that CHP, be that hydro, um, you start to have those uh, uh, installed across the conurbation. You're starting to then put them into uh, potentially portfolios because they are now in housing, they're in schools, they're in offices. What would it look like uh, if those energy uh, portfolios started to trade with each other, peer-to-peer uh, -peer type things, uh, moving up to the next level? What would happen if a council then sort of became the aggregator of all its estate, both of its school and its housing? Again, uh, landlord, social housing, a huge amount of, of, of social housing across the uh, the conurbation and the wider UK and I think they will be become significant energy players in this market through the dint of um, improving the, their tenants uh, energy dependence. Taking that forward um, once you've then got the ability of local portfolios and ownership how can you bring those together and start to aggregate and how could you sit those under an, an aggregator of aggregators if you will a tier one aggregator which could interact both with all those sub aggregators but equally uh, be outward facing into the market be that the national grid or, or energy market so that that's a, a sort of very messy diagram but that was the idea of how a high energy uh, local energy market hierarchy could work next slide please and so the LEM had two objectives um, for, for phase one. One was to understand um, basically what are the technical requirements. So what would you need to be able to do in terms of controlling uh, and reporting of these various distributed assets across the whole con whole conurbation? Uh, and secondly, how would you then start to integrate that work uh, with with other maybe local aggregators or, or wider control platforms? So we we broke it into uh, five. Um, strategic objectives, objectives, which you can see on the right hand side, we started to look about what were the regulatory and the legislation changes that would be required, what type of business models would be needed to, to make this really take off and investable, um, and then the more sort of uh, technical demand side response, energy trading side, how would you manage load profile, um, how would you be able to uh, integrate a technical platform into a number of sub virtual power plant type arrangements a number of the previous the call um, presentations have talked about your know, microgrids and local sites you know they themselves would have a role to play in a, in a local energy market how would you integrate with them versus um, a more traditional portfolio where there's just assets uh, in properties or offices that can be used for trading uh, and then essentially um, what would be the hierarchy so what would happen if um, we had uh, a stronger case to sell our energy uh, across borders into other local energy markets or into the, the wider energy market versus what would happen if we got an instruction from uh, a DSO through constraint management. Where, where would be the, the hierarchy of, of, of need in that? So that's, that's some of the things that we were looking at. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, so, um, our report basically looked at very much how the world was today, uh, and that's at the picture on the left, uh, and started to look to see how how the world could look uh, in, a, in a world uh, a future ad hoc trading. And there's a number of steps that, that sort of uh, the, the, the project looked at, which talked about the increasing complexity. But essentially, right now, left hand side, you've got um, fairly uh, straight lines. Uh, everybody understands what's everybody doing. Um, it's fairly centralised. Moving to a, a post phase four where you've got full energy de decentralization you have people selling energy to each other you have people selling energy to the network you have consumers making decisions on their own load you know how can you um, manage uh, and, and deal with all the complexity that was in that future ad hoc uh, market both in terms of what every asset is doing but if you are trading how are you able to to meet the, the demands that you've made for that trading how are you able to catch those data flows how are you able to send all those data flows to the relatively uh, to uh, the the regulators uh, how are you able to do all those plus deal with any uh, constraint management systems or signals you may be getting from the local network um, and that's really the complexity of how I think the future is going to be uh, and, and so a lot of work is going on right now to understand well exactly what does that look like and that's partly one of the reasons why, why we're all here today. Uh, next slide please. And so what did, it, what did we sort of learn from the first phase? Well the first phase was um, if uh, 
uh, if you are in any local authority, um, you probably have a number of um, what we would call stranded assets, which is where you have put low, um, distributed energy generation or storage as part of uh, other uh, innovation projects, as part of uh, landlords or asset owners just installing them to help them. So you've got all this new energy popping up into the system and it's a very unplanned uh, approach. It tends to be reflective of if you are bidding for funding to do in these sort of areas uh, at the mercy of where those partners are, are located. That's where they want to play. Um, and so we came to the conclusion that actually what you need to do is, is undertake some informed local energy area master planning. So just take a step back, see where the future is going and understanding based on how the network currently is right now in a local area moving forward um, what is the appropriate approach is it chp and heat networks is it um, uh, potentially heat pumps uh, is it somewhere in between um, secondly we need to carry on uh, and develop our um, uh, unique business models uh, to the, so we need to have an investment case ready uh, and certainly what this phase two that we're involved in is doing is looking at both a commercial um, uh, the value sharing proposition that's being led by Bruntwood uh, to understand how we can get office owners and office users involved in, in uh, reducing energy consumption and energy trading, but also domestic energy uh, uh, value sharing propositions through Bristol Energy. Uh, and then we need to understand what that, that technical and, and optimized digital platform is. That's our phase two right now. Um, we have combined with another phase one project, which was uh, the Bristol um, Energy um, consortium so we now have a quite a large consortium it's about 13 uh, members it's a approximately six million pound project uh, in total running for two years um, and we're very excited to both look at both the regulatory, regulatory changes the value sharing propositions and uh, the technical requirements that will be needed to um, to facilitate a, a local energy market product really that could then be applicable um, to any uh, area or defined any area in the UK and, and wider uh, and I think my headphones are literally about to die again so if I haven't died already uh, that is my presentation uh, completed thank you that's great thank you ever so much Neil and thanks for stepping in at the last minute as well to do this for us no problem. Uh, just a note, Jenny, just for anybody else, um, I'm afraid I won't be able to join for the rest of the day, but if there are any questions, um, I'm sure Jenny will be able to uh, take note or pass them to myself or the lead on this project, Sean Owen at the Combined Authority. Yeah, no problem at all. We'll do that for you.